renovated retirement with Charlie Jewett. Oh no, I think I'm about to have another episode. Looking through my episodes recently, I realized that number 91 was missing. Where is it? I thought to myself, how could I skip an episode? How could I lose an episode that my precious listeners need? Well, in San Diego, we're surrounded by water, and I thought maybe it's at the bottom of the ocean, so I went looking. Is it over here? Is it over there? Where is that episode 91? I need to teach people how much life insurance they need to carry. It's really important. Where is it? Is is that it? Maybe this is it. Here I am at the bottom of the ocean. I found it! I found episode 91! Now! Now! Our podcast episodes are complete. Here it is, folks. From Under the Ocean, episode 91. How much life insurance should you actually carry at different stages in your life? Wow, that was weird. Hello, folks, it's Charlie Jewett. I found the lost episode somehow in the midst of my, I can't say crazy schedule because I'm only recording a podcast every now and then. Tried to get back to weekly. In the beginning, I did daily because I was a maniac, maniac at my microphone. I don't know what that was. But in the beginning, I did a lot of podcasts. I'd like to be doing one a week. We're trying to get on that schedule with my team. Uh, But right now, I do it sporadically, sporadically spread all over the place for great retirement advice. (laughs) For ring fucking dash. For now, we found it. We found 91. It was missing. It was crazy. I don't know how I skipped one, but we are back. And what I'm going to do in this episode is talk to you about how much life insurance should you have? Why? Because life insurance is sort of considered something that in your 20s or 30s, uh, you get it when you get married because you both have, you know, incomes and you have the, the love of your life. I love you, sweetie. I love you too, baby. Love of your life. And you go, what happens if my $45,000 a year disappears and I can't take care of my baby? I'm not here. And when I say baby, I mean loved one or spouse. And then you start having real babies. Holy smokes. Life insurance gets very, very important. And so term insurance, you know, carrying a whole lot of death benefit in case you pass away becomes really important but I was trained on life insurance and all the things that nobody knows it can do uh, from 2005 until now certainly those first three or four years I was doing like crazy crazy amounts of training probably spending you know 30 to 50 thousand dollars a year on workshops and education for those first three or four years of my career and I've continued to learn all the things you can do with life insurance so the number one question because most retirees by the way most retirees don't think they need life insurance Yet life insurance and life insurance products, the, co- the products that come from life insurance companies, can do more for the retiree than the stock market could ever dream of doing, and it does it better and it does it safer. So let's talk about it. You know, before you can answer how much life insurance should I carry, and in that you know question we're talking about death benefit, we need to ask, what are we using the life insurance for? Okay, life insurance can do a number of things. One thing life insurance could do is be an alternative to bank accounts or your safe. It can be a place to put money in case you need it. And you hear it right in my language. I use it for my in-case accounts or my emergency fund accounts. But we're not going to use term life insurance because it doesn't have any cash value. Term life insurance is just you know, renting a death benefit, having somebody else cover, uh, give your family a big chunk of money to take care of them if you pass away. We're going to use a type of cash value life insurance. But we don't, don't want to use like a normal whole life. Or universal life because those have penalties for the first you know 10 to 15 years what we want to use is a modified endowment contract that means you put all the money in up front at one time what we call a single premium you have a hundred grand you just give them the whole hundred grand you don't spread it out you don't do monthly premiums or annual or five pays you just give it all to the insurance company up front that makes it what's called a modified endowment contract which for now you can just ignore what that means and then we want to add a return of premium rider. And there's not very many products that have this. And frankly, I only like, you know, really one of them, maybe two of them. But a single premium life insurance contract, probably universal life insurance indexed, indexed universal life insurance, with a return of premium rider. That's a mouthful. And it may sound like Greek to you. What that creates, though, is an alternative emergency fund. Totally liquid money you can have whenever you want to yet still historically we're earning 5 to 6%. Awesome sauce. So how much life insurance should you carry? Well, 
how much of an emergency fund should you have is going to give us our first answer. I suggest for most people that it be around, you know, ninety to a hundred thousand dollars. What's the death benefit going to be? I don't know. It's different for every age. So for that use of life insurance, there is no should. There is no, you know, how much should you carry? Whatever death benefit comes at your age for this amount of premium that you need to put away in an emergency fund is fine. No big deal. So that's one version. Another version of how to use life insurance would be to create a tax-free stream of, you know, income, so to speak. We're not really supposed to call it income, although on the life insurance brochures they still do, so it must be okay, I don't know. But, you know, a, a place to get money, a, a cash accumulation account where when you take money out, there's no taxes due. Most people would be familiar with a Roth IRA. Roth IRAs, you put after-tax money into it. You make $10,000, you pay 3500 in taxes, you put in 6500 bucks. It's never taxed again. It grows tax-free, and you can take out tax-free distributions. Well, life insurance has been that way since the 80s. I mean, we're talking you know, over 30 years where life insurance has been a Roth IRA on steroids. It's taxed exactly the same way a Roth IRA is if it's built properly. You can't make it a modified endowment contract. You can't put all the money in up front. We'll teach you what to do, but basically you got to spread it out over you know four to seven years. If you have 100 grand, you might do 20,000 a year for five years, not all at once. But if you follow these rules, which are easy, and you put money into life insurance for this reason or in this design, you end up getting tax free growth and tax free distributions. Okay. Well, Charlie, how much death benefit should I have? Well, it's not about the death benefit. Again, the first two examples of how to use life insurance are not about the death benefit, they're about the premium. How much money do you have to put in? So if somebody gets an inheritance of a million dollars, it's not IRA money, it's not stuck in a 401k or 403b, the IRS has nothing to do with it, it is your money, you get an inheritance or you sell a home, sell a business, have money sitting in the bank, whatever, you got a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, doesn't matter, and it's clean after tax money, you can put all of that into a life insurance contract built for growth, compound it tax-free like a Roth, and then take out distributions and use them to pay your bills during retirement, you've basically created a tax-free source of income, so to speak. So what should the death benefit be? Again, we just work backwards from how much premium do you have? How much money do you have that you want to put into this tool? And then we solve for the minimum required death benefit. We don't want you to have a lot of death benefit because it costs money. This whole strategy from the 80s until now was about Minimum death benefits, so really low costs, put in as much money as you can, as fast as you can, create a cash cow, make it tax-free, beat the pants off the stock market, baby, yeah, renovating retirement, pantsing the stock market. Not sure I'm going to switch to that tagline, but it was fun to say once. So life insurance can be used for in-case accounts, emergency funds. Life insurance can be used for income accounts, creating a you know tax-free source of distributions. Now, it's not guaranteed income. It's not something I'd say you can count on knowing 100% what it's going to be like an annuity where you're buying a pension, but it is an incredible source of extra income for taking trips and vacations and things like that. Uh, what else can life insurance be used for? We well, don't have to take the income. You could use it as you know increase, just growth. You just put money in there and compound it tax-free. Either use it or don't use it, and when you die, uh, it gets bigger. There's a death benefit to go to your family, so it could be used for increase accounts, and, you know, inheritance, the next life. If you've heard me talk about long life, short life, rough life, sick life, and into the next life, it can be used for the next life, you know, passing on an inheritance to loved ones. Now, let's go to a more traditional use of life insurance, just the death benefit. You know, if you need to replace your income or you want to pay off all of your debts or all of your bills, or if you died, you wanted to leave enough money for grandkids um, your kids or grandkids to complete their college or purchase their own home or buy a business, whatever it is, the more traditional use of life insurance is about the death benefit. It's about buying a giant death benefit that somebody else pays if you're not here anymore. And what do you want to pay? Giant premiums? You want to put a million dollars into the expenses? No. You want to pay the least amount of premiums possible. So if you're tracking with me, the really the two different ways to design life insurance are maximum premiums, put in whatever money you have, minimum death benefit to get some you know, feature or benefit that has nothing to do with the life insurance, to get growth or 
you know, penalty-free access or tax-free growth and income. That's one design, huge premiums, low death benefit. The other design would be the traditional way. Large death benefit, whatever it is you want, um, for the lowest premiums, the cheapest price, the way you'd shop for anything. Well, how much life insurance, how much death benefit should you have? There's different schools of thought on this, and I want to give you a couple of them, and then the one that I usually use, because I'm a super conservative guy, and I do very conservative uh, planning. I want to make sure, I want a plan. I want, you know, long life, short life, rough life, sick life, next life, no matter what happens to my clients, I want to make sure they're okay. And so the conservatives and the moderates tend to, you know, dig my, my style. So some people do something like this. They say, well, we've got a mortgage for, you know, 450 and if I died, I wouldn't be anymore, you know, here anymore. And my girlfriend Sally or my wife Sally would would have this huge mortgage and no no income coming from me. So let me get a death benefit of four fifty. They go out and they buy a policy equal to some debt they have in their life, right? Well, one one reason I don't like that is because you know it's fine, it's it's okay, it's a step in the right direction. And frankly, I think life insurance agents do that because it's easy to understand in your head, and it um, makes makes you feel like you're doing something that's safe. The reason I don't like it is one, first and foremost, paying off a mortgage is probably the stupidest thing you can ever do financially. You're you're destroying every dollar you put into that house, you're destroying its ability to earn interest for the rest of your life, and it earns more than the mortgage costs. You can easily go earn five, six, or seven. Mortgages only cost, you know, three or four. Uh, I think four, four or four point two five at the recording of this podcast. So you're hurting yourself. It's costing you money to put money into a home. Secondly, it's not a safe place to put money. If your home depreciates or is destroyed, you lose your money. <laughs> so if you put in $100,000 to a home and it goes down in value by $100,000, you lost your money, not the banks. If your home's destroyed in New Orleans, Houston, Jersey Shore, or California fires, floods and fires, sometimes you end up fighting with an insurance company to ask them for the money to rebuild. And I know people that have been fighting for 15 years here in California to rebuild. You don't want to be in that fight. It's silly. So it costs you money to pay off your house. You're losing what's called arbitrage. You're giving up, you know, six percent to save four. That's that's going the wrong direction. Plus, you're putting the money somewhere where it does have risks. Where just keeping them separate, just keeping the mortgage and keeping the money working for you, liquid, you know, accessible and safe, but working for you is is very intelligent. That's what all banks and insurance companies do: borrow low, invest high. So one, I certainly don't want the first thing someone to do if their spouse dies is to make a stupid you know, financial decision and hurt themselves. That's they don't they already have enough pain in their life. Secondly, that doesn't replace the person's income. Let's say your mortgage costs, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a month and the spouse that died was making thirty five hundred dollars a month. How's paying off the mortgage gonna keep you in the same lifestyle you had if you want to keep living that lifestyle, keep taking care of your kids. So it just it's not complete enough for me. It doesn't do enough of what I'm looking for. I'm gonna give you a really basic conservative rule of thumb. If you're looking at short life, you know what happens if one of us dies before we're supposed to and we need to continue providing an income? We want, we want the remaining spouse to have the same lifestyle that they have right now. So maybe you're each making you know $4,000 a month. Just to make it easy. You're making $4,000 a month at work. Your spouse is making $4,000 a month at work. And you say, well, what if one of us died? We want the other person to continue having a similar lifestyle. Very, very easy math. Just go ahead and take the $4,000 a month. $4,000, I'm on my iPhone calculator, times 12. So that's $48,000 a year, right? I'm ignoring taxes right now. Just $48,000 a year. Divide that by 5%. What I'm really saying is, how much money would we need in an account where if it was earning 5%, you know, kicking off a 5% return, that would be $48,000 a year. You end up with $960,000. So in my world, when I calculate, you know, uh, sh short life, when I'm not looking at, you know, growing money tax free or creating an emergency fund, when I'm looking at straight up income replacement, what happens if one of us dies and the other person needs an income? By the way, this also applies to retirees because when one of you dies, one of the social securities goes away. One of the social security paychecks goes away. The remaining spouse keeps the higher of the two. Um, some pensions will go away if it was a pension they set up before they met you and it's on single life. Plus, you're going to be a single taxpayer. You're dropping in how much standard deduction you have and what you know how much taxes you pay. So your income goes down, your taxes go up. So we need income replacement for retirees as well. This is not a young family thing. This is a human thing. So if you're making forty-eight thousand dollars a year, 
we need about 960 or let's just call it a million bucks. We need a million bucks making, you know, you know, 4.8 to 5%. So how much life insurance did you carry? Carry a million dollars. <laughs> Go buy a policy, a term policy or a, you know, guaranteed universal life or a whole, whatever. Just purchase a life insurance policy for a million dollars. Some of you that are savvy are going, but wait, Charlie, wait, 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 wait. If I set up my in-case accounts using life insurance, single premium modified down the contract, and I set up some income or increase accounts for tax-free growth, tax-free distributions using life insurance products, even though it's not about the death benefit, wouldn't both of those strategies, wouldn't both of those products come with some death benefit that just needs to be there legally? And the answer to you, smart person, is yes. Good job. Good thinking. So the real type of planning that I do and that I would suggest you do, mortgage plan, estate plan, retirement plan, insurance plan, and tax plan. Remember the five pieces of a retirement plan. It's called merit planning. Mortgage plan, estate plan, retirement plan, um, insurance plan, and tax plan. I would do your insurance plan last. I would do all of your other planning, your mortgage planning, taking money out of your house or stop paying extra principal and redirect it to life, whatever. I would do your mortgage plan, your estate plan, certainly your retirement plan. Move all your assets where they should be because lots of them probably will end up in some sort of cash value life insurance product. Move everything where it should be and then ask the question, how much death benefit did we just pick up coming along for the ride from that, say it's $500,000, and how much do we need for income replacement? Now we go to the insurance plan or the short life plan. Oh, we need a million or 960 I came up with. It was called a million. We need a million dollars? And the other parts of our plan means we're worth 500000 or I'm worth $500,000 if I die? Okay. All I have to do is buy a term policy for 500000 or possibly buy a permanent life insurance policy for $500,000. That's how you know how much life insurance you carry. Even more conservative than what I just said because cash value life insurance policies, if you cancel one of them, the emergency fund, the death benefit goes away. As you take money out tax-free from the other one, the death benefit's going to go down. So the most conservative way to do this is to buy a million-dollar policy just for income replacement and have the other ones where the life insurance comes along for the ride. But you certainly could, especially if you're tight on money and can't afford all the insurance you need. You certainly could just say, well, I've got $500,000 from the retirement plan and the mortgage plan. So what do I need for my insurance plan? Just another $500,000. That gives me the million dollars I need that if I disappear, my spouse gets a million dollars and they can invest it with Charlie at Renovating Retirement and get 4.8 to 5% or whatever we can get and kicks off a similar income as if I were here to be alive and take care of my family. Now, there's also, as opposed to income replacement, there's just the desire to leave some specified chunk of money. Hey, if I die, I'd like to leave, you know, uh, you know, $200,000 to each kid so I know they can get through college at $50,000 a year for four years. You could do that. You have three kids. You need $200,000 each. You just buy a $600,000 permanent life insurance policy. Or you have an alma mater or a charity that really matters to you. You say, I will not leave this earth without giving $200,000 to puppies for life or whatever. I'm making up stuff, you know, charities. You can also just buy specifics amount of money. Actually, let's do another fun one. Um, what about what's called legacy planning? You know, how much life insurance should I carry? Ask yourself, do you have working children? So if you're in your 60s and 70s, you might have working children, even in your 50s. You might have kids who are, you know, in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they're working. They're doing their own saving for retirement. Well, most likely, where are they doing that saving? They're listening to the joker brokers. They're listening to the three pillars of financial deception. Pay off your mortgage, postpone taxes to a later date, and diversify only using securities. Spread all your money around stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So they're probably paying off a mortgage and putting a whole bunch of money into 401ks, IRAs, 403bs. What are they doing? They're sticking money in a house where it's not safe, lowering their tax deductions, postponing taxes till later when they think they'll be higher. If we ask them, they think taxes are going to be higher later, yet they're postponing taxes till later. And they're locking the money into accounts where you can only use stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So they're subjecting themselves to risk as more people are retiring than ever before, and the stock market has so much pressure on it not to grow like it has been. Well, that's not a great plan. You can actually teach, with my help or with my team's help, we can actually teach 
these kids how to redirect what they're putting into mortgages, what they're putting into 401ks and IRAs if they're not matched, back into a life insurance policy, get ready for it, on you. What, Charlie? You sound crazy. Well, I am crazy, but I learned this from somebody who's not. If your kids buy life insurance on you, what they're doing is leaving themselves a tax-free inheritance. They're just buying a retirement account. They know exactly how much it's going to be. They can get a million-dollar policy on you. They buy a million dollars of tax-free money when you pass away. Well, how old are they going to be when you pass away? Let me ask you a question. How many of you had kids when you were seven years old? Not. How many of you had kids when you were 12 or 13? Maybe a couple, but most people don't. What's the most common age in the United States for someone to start having their first, second, third child? Probably in your 20s. Honestly, late 20s maybe. Maybe it's getting up into the 30s, but, you know, 20s. Somewhere in the 20s there. So say you're 22 and you have your first kid. So at life expectancy when you're 87 or 90 or whatever it is, let's say when you're 90, 20, subtract 22 years, how old is your child? They're 68. They're right about retirement age. The beautiful thing about legacy planning, completely tax-free transfer of wealth. The children know exactly what they're going to get, and you know what they're going to get. They just don't know when they're going to get it. You know, if your kids hate you and you think they're going to poison you, don't use this strategy. <laughs> That's not a smart idea. But if you have a loving family, this is how the wealthy do it. They use each tool for what it does best. What does life insurance do really well? For low premiums, you leave a giant amount of tax-free money. They can just buy themselves a retirement account, not have to worry about all the baloney inside of 401ks and IRAs. How much is it going to be taxed at? What's it going to be worth? Mystery balance at a mystery tax rate. That's what 401ks and IRAs are. What is a life insurance policy on your parents? Guaranteed balance. Guaranteed tax-free. You just don't know when, but unless your parents had you when they were six and seven years old, you're going to be fine. I hope this helps. Just some ideas on how much life insurance you should carry. If you'd like our help, just get in touch. Charlie at JewettWealth.com, C-H-A-R-L-I-E at JewettWealth.com, J-E-W-E-T-T, Wealth.com. Go to WatchCharlie.com for my YouTube videos. Get in touch, and we will be happy to help you with no sales, no pressure, no commute. Just good, virtual, incredible retirement coaching from the comfort of your home. Best retirement plan on the planet, baby. Boop, 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 boop. Love you guys. You people are the best. Renovate. Retirement. With Charlie G. Ba doop, ba doop, ba doop. That is all, folks.